Charles Wesley. It was his home, Charles Wesley, and it's called the tune is called Hyperdot for some reason. Sorry, right, Nathan. It's just called. Oh, I'll go to my phone. Okay, you guys do that. What? Oh yeah, it's really weird. <laughs> anyway, um, unless the words on this, I always, I just want to say this, because the words I think are really interesting for, for Charles Wesley. Because yeah. he, he starts out with the word love. Not love.
We hold as sacred the oneness of all people and all creation. Oh. I haven't done this for a couple of years. We hold as sacred that there are many pathways to God. Christianity is one of them. The teachings of Jesus inspire us to love ourselves and others more greatly without shame or blame. We hold as sacred the power of community and prayer. We hold as sacred that love comes in many forms and support anyone who is finding their own way to live out love in the world. We hold as sacred that we are loved, we matter, we are part of God's plan. We're going to be passing the peace. You've never done it. I say peace of God be with you. You guys shout back and also with you. You turn to your neighbor. Give away to the people who are traveling during this spiritual time with you together today. So, the peace of God be with you. Trent, say hi to the people who are here with us today. Thank you. And you can be seated.
cards, thank you for the emails, thank you for the calls, thank you for people who came to my mother's uh, service, uh, thank you uh, for the hugs, thank you for the good wishes today, thank you for the people who filled in for two weeks, very last minute for the last two weeks. Y'all know who you are, I'm so grateful to you. Um, thank you to everyone um, who has been so kind to me. My mother did pass two weeks ago. She was 95, but it was very sudden, and I think that's pretty much a hallmark of a great life, right? When you pass at 95 and no one expects it. Um, and I am grateful to this community, truly, 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 as is my family, so thank you. If you're here for the first time, you want to meet some RU speakers. We are actually not doing refreshments right now until Joan returns next week. Um, but please, if you want to stay after and ask me about what goes on here, or anyone else about what goes on here, there's some, there are not some. Everyone who goes here is a truly lovely person who would love to say hi to you, so take the time to do that if you can. Rumi! We have a new date for the Rumi exhibition since I couldn't go two weeks ago. The date is now the Wednesday after Labor Day weekend. If you want to go, uh, we're going to leave the church at about 3.15. Just call the office and we'll set you up with a ride, okay? We're really looking forward to this. Table help. If you can help uh, set up the tables for the meal program after the meal, uh, after the service. See, I am operating on even less of a brand than usual. Uh, after the service, please do. If you need to be told how to get to the gym, we'll be happy to let you know. And it takes about, about 15 minutes to help set up tables. And it is much appreciated. I'm saying there is fitness thing after church. Ignore this. Chris is here. Yay, Chris. Let's do fitness thing after church. Um, if you've never done a fitness thing, you come up to the front, the back, wherever you decide, Chris, we're going to be, and we sit, and we sing, and it's super fun. Really casual, very, very fun. Sorry? Tim. Does anyone really think I should be preaching today? <laughs>
one of the big ones, like a prodigal son that actually uh, Paul Hawk is going to be presenting next week. But the parable of the foolish bridesmaids has ancient wisdom in it that always speaks so clearly to me about the first and most important thing I need to know to live well in this world, well with myself, well with others, well with whatever we think is God's in us. So Bettina's going to come and read the story of the foolish bridesmaids. Thanks, Bettina. Good morning, everybody. So, the, um, so this is Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13, the New Revised Standard Version. Then the kingdom of heaven will, take, will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No. There will be not enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went out to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. Thank you, Tina, so much. Seriously, right there. Okay, it's on. Hi, people who are listening at home. Have you ever slept through something? Missed something because you slept right through it? Final exam. Very good friend's wedding. <laughs> Same good friend's second wedding. There's a message there somewhere. No longer my friend. We're just not as close. <laughs> but you know, like you set the clock, right? You mean to get up when the clock goes, and you just kind of lean over and you do that, right? It's too easy, like that, and like that, and like that, and like that. And on the fourth time you're going, nobody should be having a wedding this early in the morning anyway, and bang, bang, right? right? And if I have to drive to Peterborough, I mean, it's over, right? <laughs> no, we love Peterborough, Margo. It just felt like a long way at the time. <laughs> but we feel terrible, don't we, after? I mean, after, when you wake up and you've had the good sleep, most of the time you probably go, through that. You know, I should have got up to see the coronation because it was historic. Maybe. Or I, I really should have been at. I wish I had been at. Because now you feel okay and you wish that you had gotten up. The idea of being awakened is, is very big in the Bible. It's all through the Bible. The idea that someone is awakened uh, during the night to something very particular that they don't want to miss. It changes their lives. The one I always think of most particularly is the story of Samuel, the young boy who's asleep. He works in the temple, and three times during the night he hears, Samuel, Samuel, wake up, and he wakes up and he goes to his master and says, did you call me? His master says, no, I didn't call you. Samuel goes back to sleep, and then finally they realize that it's the voice of God calling Samuel to his mission, telling him who he really is and meant to be in this world. There are many other instances of people going to sleep and when they wake up or during the night they are awoken. There's this idea that somehow the coming, incoming of God comes to us when we're asleep. 
And we get that, right? I mean, how often have you gone to sleep and not known the answer to the, you know, crossword puzzle, and the next morning you wake up and you've got it? Or not known how you're going to finish off some presentation or speak to someone, and the next morning you've got it. Something happens, and we wake up, and we find something different that we didn't have before. The story of the foolish bridesmaids is really that kind of story, isn't it? It's a story where they go to sleep and they wake up, and when they wake up, something monumental is happening. It's always interesting to me to note that the stories that Jesus tells have two things in common. The first is they're all about the kingdom of heaven, right? He must have like 20, I think there's 29 parables that say, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is, they all start, the kingdom of heaven is like this. He's trying to teach people this is what your way to peace looks like. This is what your way to living well in the world looks like. And he uses these teaching stories and he says them over and over and over in different ways to try to help people get that. But the other thing they have in common, many of them, is that he didn't make them up. Jesus didn't make these stories up. In many cases, we know that these were ancient stories that predated Jesus. We've seen them in other cultures. We've seen them in other places before Jesus. He chose the stories that made his point, as a storyteller does, and used them, sometimes changing them. This one is a good case in point. This was found in ancient Sumerian stories. It's still about foolish bridesmaids. But there's no mention of the lamp. So in the ancient Sumerian story, probably a thousand years before Jesus, um, the bridesmaids are waiting for the groom to come. The symbolism here is, is twofold. One is that you never knew when the pri uh, groom's party was going to arrive because they were probably coming from a long distance. And the other thing was that hospitality was so important in this area of the world at this time. So the idea that you were not ready immediately to offer hospitality to an honored guest was beyond the pale. I mean, this was atrocious. If anything should keep you awake, it would be the arrival, the imminent arrival of a bridegroom and his family and his retinue so that you could give him hospitality whenever he got there. In the Sumerian story, very much like the story you just heard Bettina read, the bridesmaids are waiting and waiting and waiting, and they go to sleep. <clears throat> then finally the bridegroom and his retinue arrive, and only half of them wake up. And they go in with the bridegroom, welcoming him, inviting him in, and the others simply sleep through the big event. So why does this matter to us? Why is this one of my favorite, favorite, favorite stories? It's because at the heart of the idea of the kingdom of heaven, and the idea that we might be able to live a little more peacefully, a little more gently, more a little graciously with ourselves, with each other, with whatever we think God to be, is the idea of who we actually are. It's about waking up to who we actually are. We have lots of ideas of who we are. There was a study done at Princeton University a number of years ago where they sat a group of kids down, new students down, and they said, okay, who are you? Tell us one thing. And without exception, they first told where they were from. Okay, I'm from. The second thing they said was, well, this is my first year and I'm studying. The third thing they said was, okay, I'm male, female, whatever they identified as. The third thing, and Kenny went like that, but it was pretty uniform. And as they kept asking and kept asking and kept asking, no, who are you? The students were at a loss for words. And we get that, don't we? If someone said, who are you? I think I would probably start with, well, I'm a you know, middle-aged white woman, I'm from Markham, I work in a church, that kind of thing. But that's not who I am. Who I am according to the kingdom of God, who I truly am, is God's image in the world. Right? The Bible tells us that, right? We're created in God's image. I mean, you know, that's been taken to be that, that we're created in God's image means that if, sorry guys, if you're white and male, you know, you're in God's image. I mean, I'm not really sure where that came from, 
uh, because nowhere in the Bible does it say that God is white or male. Uh, but what it does say over and over, and what every Sunday school teacher's kid learns, is God is love. Thank you. It's the first thing you learn in Sunday school, right? God is love. So if we're created in God's image, that means the absolute fundamental bedrock, foundational thing that we are is divine love. Not just that we're visited with divine love, not just that we can access divine love, but that our being is divine love. That's who we are. That's a hard one to accept, isn't it? I also think back to my days in university. Um, I took drama, theater, and we were made to do all sorts of crazy things. You can attest to this, right? <laughs> and one of them was uh, we had to pair up. One of us had to sit on a chair, and the other one had to walk around us. I think we'd been together for about a year by that, this group, and, and say things that they liked about us. We were so uncomfortable. The one on the chair was so uncomfortable. It reminded me of another exercise I'd once done where uh, we were asked to name three things you want to change about yourself and three things you love about yourself. Everyone could come up with the first three. And people struggled to say the other three, either because we didn't know or because we, thir we weren't allowed. There was something egoic about that. There was something narcissistic about that. I can't say nice things about myself. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, no, in fact, who you are, who you are is divine and perfect love. So what happens to that with us in the world? How do we upset that core of peace, that feeling of being divine love? We upset it because we don't believe it. We don't accept it. We fall, the Bible would say, asleep to that idea. And instead we dream. And in our dreams we tell ourselves that there's any number of other ways or things or people, whatever we need to feel to loved, to be okay, to feel loved. Okay, so to feel loved, I need people to treat me a certain way and to feel loved, I need uh, certain stuff in my life and to feel loved, I need a certain, position. all those things, right? None of those, though, satisfy us, do they? Because we get those things. And we still don't feel that we are perfect cores of love. I said a few weeks ago that the, the lab, the growing lab for the Holy Spirit is relationships, right? Relationships, that's where we grow, that's where we learn. Those are the hard parts. That's where the rubber of what we think we want to do meets the road is when we get in front of other people. And one of the things that happens when we don't accept that foundationally we are divine love is that we do try to get something from every other person we meet. So you think about having a conversation with someone that you know. And a lot of the time, our mind is judging it in terms of, am I getting what I need from this person? Am I feeling enough respect? Am I feeling seen? Am I feeling wanted? Are they doing what I want? That is often where we enter into relational conversation. I was talking to a woman a few weeks ago, and she was saying to me, you know, when my husband and I get together, we just seem to talk past each other, and we get angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier. And I said, well, what do you want? And she said, I just want him to respect me. And I said, what if you brought that to the conversation? Now, I'm not saying you should hang out with people who don't respect you, but what if you brought the idea to the conversation that you are respected and respected him? What if you didn't need to get that from him? What if you didn't need for him to fulfill that need? What if you didn't need for him to show you that? Because he's in the same place. He's standing in front of you and he's needing something from you. So now we've got a conversation 
between two people who are just trying to get something from each other that they're not supposed to get from anywhere other than their own heart and soul. Now, that does not mean that we don't want to be with people who respect us and love us. But if we don't have that, if we don't bring that, we're never going to get that from a relationship. We will have people who make us feel good. We'll have people who make us feel loved. We'll have that, but we won't carry it with us in any way that tangibly changes our journey in a consistent way. And that's what this parable is all about. It's what all of the parables are all about. It's what all of the teachings of Jesus were all about. Jesus spent his time going to the people who were the least likely to feel that they were love and divine love, the power of divine love in the world. Jesus went to, you know, the tax collectors and women and disciples who were fishermen, right? He hung out with some of the most vulnerable people. The people who needed to be told, you're not what you have, you're not what you do, you're not what other people think of you. You are divine love, a spark of perfect grace. You are a child of God. That's the core identity he was sharing with people. Jesus came to wake people up to who we are. To who we are. And when we're able to hold on to that, to live into that, to build and nurture that in ourselves, we find that everything around us changing because we're not trying to get from other people what we ourselves feel we can't get from ourselves. That's why when people say to me, well, you, you know, you teach spirituality or you talk about spirituality, isn't that kind of frivolous? I say, this is the most practical thing you can do. This is the most practical thing you can spend your time on because this is the only way to foundationally change your concept of what your presence is in this world, what your role is in this world, and how you exist in this world. Unless you change your concept to, I am divine love, Nothing got done or said or been changes that. Yeah, I've made mistakes. Yeah, I have to take responsibility, but that does not change who I am at the center. Unless we change that, it does not matter what else we do. Unless we come from there. And we can come from there. The kingdom of heaven is can continue to be elusive. I mean, Buddha said it. Look within. Thou art the Buddha. Jesus said it. The kingdom of heaven is within you. It means it's already here. So we need to watch those messages we give ourselves that say we're lesser because. We're not as good because. We're not worthy because. We need to watch those messages. We need to take responsibility for the places that we have hurt others and ourselves, but we need to understand and remind ourselves that doesn't change who I am. I years ago heard uh, a talk by Thomas Merton, a very famous Trappist monk who wrote some beautiful spiritual books. Um, Thomas Merton was talking about his own awakening. He had entered the seminary or the, the monastery uh, very much uh, in the, the mindset that we're all sinners and need to be saved, right? <laughs> and, and he carried that. And he said he didn't find it made him particularly peaceful. He didn't find it really opened himself up necessarily to others. Um, and he said then he went through a period where he suddenly felt that he had gone to sleep. He, he, he felt that he was somehow not responding to what he heard in their church services or felt when they, anyone spoke to him. He felt like he was going through a walking sleep. Until one day, he said, he was out in the fields doing his work and he had this sudden realization, all I am is love. And all I'm here to do is to share that love with others. And then he went on to write some of the most amazing spiritual books that have ever been written. We don't all have that moment like that in the fields. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But we are all assured that we are like the bridesmaids. 
that we can wake up. And when we do, we go in and share this amazing, abundant, bountiful life, which is the celebration at the end. Now, I always think about, well, why did Jesus change it then? Why did Jesus put in about the lamps, okay? Because that's odd, right? It was a good story where they just fell asleep and some woke up and were able to share in the celebration. And I think there may be a couple of reasons. I mean, maybe he just learned it that way, but I think one is that oil was precious. And to wake up is an absolutely precious thing. It needs to be treated with all the reverence in the world that this is sacred to me, and I wish to wake up to my true nature. I think the other thing is that really odd bit where the one bridesmaids who had the oil wouldn't share with the others. And I think the message there is simple. Nobody can do this for you. Nobody can do this for you. But you can. You can claim the light and the love that you are. You can look for the places where you are taught that that is true, because it takes many parables for people to start to get it. And it takes us many consistent times of telling ourselves who we truly are before we even start to believe it. We can read, we can meditate, we can share with others who are looking for the same sense of who they truly are. We can be the awakened bridesmaids. We can fill our own lamps. I love this story. I love this story because it tells me you already have what you need. You already are what you want to be. The life that you want to live is here for you. Doesn't mean it won't have troubles. Doesn't mean I won't make mistakes. But fundamentally, you are going to live in that place of celebration and rejoicing and abundance that is that wedding feast. Because you're going to wake up and realize, I'm not just love. You're not just loved. You absolutely and truly and fundamentally and forever are the divine love of our God. Thanks be to God.
with us today. God bless them. Put them on our prayer list. Put them on our prayer list. Let us pray. These are the prayers of the people, so please pray with me. God, though everything we know you, and however we experience you in our individual lives, today we pray for all those who suffer from not knowing who they are. May all who feel separate, lesser, other, or anything but a beloved, perfect child of God feel your presence and know your love in them. Today we pray for the unhoused and the marginalized, and for the politicians and others who are working to put safe and healthy roofs over so many people's heads. Let us find the best way forward for our earth and for ourselves. We ask a blessing today on Bettina's cousin Elizabeth. May she find clarity and direction. We ask a blessing on Diane and on Jane. We say a prayer of gratitude for the rescue of those who were trapped in the cable car in Pakistan. Let us never forget to be grateful for those who put their own lives at risk to rescue people from so many situations. We ask for safe travels for all of our Rockstone Community Church family who are in far places or near places. Bring them back safely to us. We ask a blessing on Penny's son Chris and his new wife who were married yesterday. May their union bring them joy and enrich their lives and the lives of all who are close to them. We ask a blessing on those who have been displaced because of the changes in our global climate. Help us all to work towards a different relationship with this earth. And we ask a blessing and say a prayer of gratitude for everyone here at Monsonsville United Church. May we know in ourselves and each other the reflection of your perfect and divine love. Please stand up for our blessings and benedictions. Thanks to everyone who's here. Who's here for the first time? Who's here for the first time? Hey, come. Huh? What's your name? Tina? Danielle? Everyone say hi to Danielle. Hi, Danielle. We're so glad you're here. Danielle's got the prettiest bracelet on. Come here, ask her where she got it. <laughs> so go out into the world, go with a daring and tender faith. Remember who you are, and your love and your light will transform your world and everyone's. And may the love of God and the guidance of our teacher Jesus Christ and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us, everyone, now and forever. Amen. We do have a three-part Amen.